Well, good morning and welcome to Milton Bible Church Online. We are so glad that you are with us and that you are watching in this moment. See, we believe that whoever's watching this is not by chance. You didn't stumble upon this just because you're scrolling through your feed. You're watching this because we believe God would love for you to watch this right now. And so thank you to those of you that have taken the time to just hit play. Now, to those of you that have been with us from the beginning, from the middle of March, we're so thankful. And we see you in the comments, liking and sharing and participating. We just love seeing that. And so go ahead, hit like, hit share, and be sure to engage in the comments. Now, as you know, we've had a number of people join us on Sundays uh, in person at the Connect Center for worship. And it's been fantastic to see one another and to worship with one another, to chat with one another, of course, all with under the umbrella of safety as we try and do this well. But I just want to let all of you know about an exciting opportunity that's happening on September the 12th. On the 13th, Jordan. 13th. On September the 13th, we're having our kickoff, and it's going to be fantastic. We're actually hoping to have as many people there as possible so that we can have three services. There will be two and services. Two services. And we're going to have two services so we can have as many people there as possible. And we want you there. And we want you there so bad that we actually said that what can we do to bring people to church on the 12th, the 13th? Uh, and that is we're going to have ice cream ice cream truck as we typically do on kickoff Sunday and it's going to be there at kickoff Sunday on September the 13th and we're going to have two services and so we would love to see you there and in the meantime we're just going to encourage you to, to reach out if you have questions about our Sunday gatherings maybe ask a friend that's been here and I'm sure that you will see that we are going above and beyond to make sure this is a safe place for everyone that would like to come in the meantime if you'd like to stay home of course we're for you we love you and we understand completely now, this morning, you are going to be blessed by what God has to bring. Joe Brzeau and his band are going to lead us in some worship, and Jim is going to finish off our series on sliders, and I know you're going to be very encouraged. So why don't we begin by preparing our hearts with worship with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this morning, and God, we just pray that even as we worship in our respective homes, that as we watch this, God, that your presence would be so real wherever we find ourselves. So God, we just ask, would you come now by your Holy Spirit, and God, would your word change our hearts, and may we meet with you this morning, even if we are worshiping virtually. Lord, we love you, and we just pray that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. We are so pleased that you've joined us here online um, as we want to worship with you today. Uh, my name is Joe, and I have a team of my family, um, and of Rachel Harnum, and of Paul Mello today who is joining us, so we're thankful to have everyone here uh, as we lead you. Um, we know that God has been faithful this week, and uh, here, we again, here we are again online, um, and we are leading you to a place where we know that God is, and God is, is, uh, is with us. He is here with us, and he's worthy of our praises, and he's worthy of our worship. So um, wherever you are, he's worthy of your worship. So join us today uh, as we worship him. And as we sing these songs, um, we just pray that you would, and we invite you to sing with us. Sing loudly, clap, dance, do whatever you need to do, but uh, just join us in worship as we sing. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain, and worthy is the King who conquered the grave, and worthy is this Lamb who was slain. The king conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. Worthy is the king conquered the grave. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. 
How sweet the sound 
All right. Well, hey, Milton Bible Church. One of the fun times of being a church family is getting to celebrate when precious little babies are born. And so today we are here to celebrate and to dedicate Hazel McMullen. And we're here with Dan and Danielle McMullen and their son Hudson, uh, who was dedicated a few years ago. And so what we want to do is we want to dedicate this precious little girl to the Lord. So before they do that, before we uh, pray and do that, just want to explain a little bit about what's happening. The psalmist says that uh, children are an heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. And what that means really is that the children that we have as Christians, we recognize that they are a gift from God and primarily they belong to God. And so what Dan and Danielle are doing today is they are dedicating uh, not only Hazel to the Lord and recognizing that Hazel, first of all and foremost, belongs to God, but also they're dedicating themselves to raise Hazel in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to raise her to be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're dedicating her to the glory of God and really uh, putting her into God's hands and trusting God completely with her. So we're just here to celebrate that and to be excited with them and to really um, enjoy God's favor upon them as a family. Now, they have put together something in writing that Mary is going to read. And um, so we'd just like to share that with you now. It's just a, a beautiful piece that they've written uh, for Hazel for today on our dedication day. Dan and Danielle have written the following for Hazel's dedication. Hazel Deanne Marie McMullen, you made your way into this world on May 17th, 2020 at 2.32, faster than ever. Huge shout out to our amazing midwife, Abigail Corbin, for helping you enter the world. Ever since that moment, you have been a gift we never knew we needed. You fit into our family so well. You're the chatterbox for sure, the happiest, most beautiful girl, but will definitely tell anyone when you're ready for a nap. Mommy and Daddy always loved the name Hazel. Both picked it out before you were known about. We picked Deanne, named after your Grandma Willis, who has made a huge impact in your mommy's life. A strong woman that so many people look up to. Someone I inspire to be like. Someone who only gets stronger over the years. Someone who loves you dearly. We picked Marie, named after Grandma McMullen. Someone who we adore, think so highly of, and is always there for us, no matter what. As our little girl, we pray daily that you will never forget your worth, never doubt your strength. We hope you always follow your dreams and believe God has such an amazing journey and purpose for you. Our verse that we chose for you is, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Isaiah 14.10 we pray you never feel alone. You always feel loved because, little girl, you are so, so loved. Your beauty already shines from the inside out. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Proverbs 31:25. my prayer for you. Mommy and Daddy and Big Brother Hudson love you so much. Thank you for being the perfect addition to our family. Thank you guys for writing that. That's beautiful. All right, so we're going to pray for you and uh, ask God's blessing upon this precious little girl. All right, Father, we just thank you for the McMullen family. And we thank you for their desire to follow after you and to teach their daughter to follow Jesus Christ. We just pray for Hazel. And we pray that at an early age, she would come to faith in Jesus Christ. She would realize, Jesus, that you are her savior and that you are the great lover of her soul. And so we just pray, Lord, that she would discover you at a very young age and that she would grow and be faithful to you and seek to be a great witness for you. We just thank you for her and this precious gift that she is. 
we pray that you would just bless her like the amazing women of old, uh, the great matriarchs of Israel. We pray that you would make her as unto uh, Sarah, who was the mother of a nation. And so we ask, Lord Jesus, that you would bless her, that you would walk with her, that you would fill her with your Holy Spirit, and that she would know your love uh, her entire life. And we pray for Dan and Danielle, and we ask that you would bless them and that you would bless their marriage together. We pray that they would grow uh, together and that they would follow you with their whole hearts. We pray, Lord, that you would be the object of their affection and their attention, the center of their home. And we pray, Lord, as they do that, that you will bless them. We pray that you would help them to be more in love with each other every day and to be more in love with you. And so bind their hearts together, we ask. And we pray that Hudson would just continue to be a great big brother, a great protector, a great example, and just a great person to have fun with as Hazel grows up. So, Lord, we thank you for this family, and we pray your blessing upon them. And we dedicate this precious life to your glory and honor. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Congratulations, guys. This is a COVID hug right here. <laughs>
You know people who've kind of lost their zest for life? They're kind of down in the mouth. They're kind of moping around. They're kind of, you know, folks that, that really don't get excited about things that are important anymore. And, <clears throat> and they're not excited about the things that matter most. Well, today we're going to see that Jesus has a disdain for lukewarm people who lack passion for him and the gospel. And so we're going to finish our series on sliders today, the seven letters to the seven churches of Revelation chapter 2 and 3, seven churches in Asia Minor that we've been studying, modern day Turkey. And what we found is there's some common themes that are in these letters to the churches. One of the common themes is this, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And there's a a theme that churches have a tendency to shift or to drift or to slide or to, to, to lose track and lose focus. And there's a couple of reasons that that happens that we've studied from the churches. One of the reason is because uh, a moment of pleasure. The world is attractive, the world tempts us and we go for it and we lose focus and we get off track. The second is this, is persecution, oppression. People who, when we express our faith or seek to live out our faith, they don't appreciate it and they mention it. And if you are a Christian long enough and if you are going to be vibrant and vocal about your faith long enough, you are going to face opposition. You are going to face persecution. It may come at work, it may come at school, it may even come in your own home or from your own family. But you will receive it. And those are the two places that we find Revelation, the seven churches have struggled with. But we also see in these letters that no matter how far you slide, no matter how far you go from the presence of God, there is always a way back. That God loves prodigals and all those who would come back to him. And there's always room at the Father's table for those who would come back into fellowship with him and take the path that he lays out. So let me ask you something. Where are you at today? Where are you at today? Well, I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you to choose life. I would encourage you to choose God. And I would encourage you to take the path that God's word opens up for you to take. Come to God with all that is broken, with all that is wrecked, with all that is ruined, even an apathetic, beat up and bruised heart. Come to him and allow Christ to come into that brokenness. But you know what? That cannot happen with a lukewarm heart. Let me tell you about this church that this letter is written to, the church in Laodicea. Of all the seven churches, this is the wealthiest church. It is the wealthiest city. It, the, the Laodicea is on a major trade route of Asia Minor. There are many merchants. There are many traders. That means a lot of business, a lot of money, a lot of uh, things exchanging hands. It is also the major uh, banking center in all of Asia Minor. So it's where kind of like the bank's head offices all are. It's the Toronto of, of, of Ontario. Um, it, it's where all the money is exchanged and the banking centers exist. It's also known for its textile industry. In fact, there's a black wool that is manufactured in Laodicea that you can't get anywhere else. It is fashionable in the ancient Near East. It is, it, a lot of wealthy people are wearing it, and it is well-known, Laodicea, the place where the black wool comes from. It's also a medical hub. It's known for its medicine, in fact, specifically for its eye ointment. You know that in uh, Ontario, 
We have a number of fabulous hospitals, and they are known all over the world for specific things. So if you think of Princess Margaret Hospital, you think of cancer treatment. If you think of Trillium, you think of, of heart you know, surgeries. If you think of Hamilton General, oftentimes you think of, of head injuries that are, are, are sick kids. Very well known. Many of these hospitals are known throughout the world, and Laodicea is a no, is known as a place where a special eye ointment has been made, uh, has been discovered and is manufactured. And it's an eye ointment that helps those who live in the Middle East with the wind and the sun and the heat. And, and it just has incredible medicinal qualities. And so this really is quite, quite a city. Um, all of these things led to an abundance of wealth, actually an overabundance of wealth. So much so that in AD 60, Laodicea experienced a major earthquake and Rome came as kind of that, you know, as overseeing, uh, you know, as part of the empire, Rome came and said, hey, we'd like to help you rebuild the city. Laodicea was so wealthy, they said to the feds, no, we do not need any of your help. We do not need any money. Now, that's a pretty unusual thing that a city in Canada would say to the federal government, no, 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 no. We got more than enough for everything that we need going on, even to go through and rebuild from an earthquake. I mean, can you imagine the wealth of this city? Are you starting to get a picture of what this community's like? But they did have one problem. And you know what that problem was? It was a limited water supply. And so they had to bring in their water from outside sources, from two other neighboring cities. One source was Colossae, and Colossae got its water from the, mount, from the mountaintops in the springs. And it was clear, it was crystal, it was cold, and it ran down the mountains into Colossae. The other source of water for Laodicea was Hierapolis, which was known for its hot springs. So what would happen is these two sources of water the water would be transferred to Laodicea from these two cities to Laodicea by aqueduct, by a system of canals. But by the time it got to Laodicea, it was no longer ice cold. Um, in fact, the, the spring water was full of minerals. And so what happened by the time it got to the city of Laodicea, it was warm, it was tepid, it smelled of minerals. In fact, Laodicea is a great place to visit, but don't drink the water is kind of the way it went down there. Kind of yucky. It smelled, it tasted of minerals, and it was warm. Now, most of this, all of this, really added up to a city that was incredibly self-reliant. They did not have many needs. And the church took on the character and the culture of the city. And too often that is the case of the church, isn't it? Instead of being countercultural and unlike the culture of the city in which the church exists, um, oftentimes, too oftentimes, the church becomes more like the city that it's in and adopts its culture instead of being countercultural. Too often that's the case of the church to become like the city it's in instead of the church being a culture changer. Self-reliance and self-sufficiency can lead to people becoming a people who do not need God or a church that doesn't need God. And what Jesus says to this church and finds in the church of Laodicea, their self-sufficiency uh, caused them to be lukewarm. And it was caused by their self-sufficiency, which actually, Jesus said, made him sick. So here's the big idea. A self-sufficient church makes Jesus sick. That is the big idea that we find in this letter to the church at Laodicea, that a self-sufficient church makes Jesus sick. And there are three reasons 
that it makes Jesus sick. The first one is this, that self-sufficiency makes us ineffective with the gospel. Look at verse 14. It says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Now this is a self-description that Jesus gives to John to write to the church in Laodicea. And understand, the words that Jesus uses to write to the churches as he describes himself and introduces the letter are always incredibly important. They're, they're pertinent, they are personal, and they are helpful to the church who will listen. And so um, it, it, God has a way of just communicating uniquely to you and uniquely to me. And there's a real beauty in that, isn't there? Because God speaks to each one of us differently and each one of us individually. And there are things that are going to reach me that aren't going to reach you. And things that God does to reach out to you that he doesn't do for me. And that is okay. Because God knows us and he speaks our language and he reaches out to each one of us with his love. The three descriptors. That Jesus is the amen, the faithful and true witness, and the beginning of God's creation. Now when Jesus says that he is the amen, what he's saying is I am the bold affirmation of truth. That he is the God of truth. He is the passionate God of truth. You know what? We have some churches today that you could call them the whiteout church. And what they do is they take some of the uh, uh, scripture and they say, well, I don't like this, so I'm going to white it out. And I don't like that, so I'm going to white it out. And I don't like that, so I'm going to white it out. I remember walking down the street one day in the town of Milton here with a, one, another one of the local pastors. And uh, I said, you know, uh, do you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven? And he said, no, of course I don't believe that. I said, well, what, what do you think Jesus meant when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And I said, well, what do you think Jesus meant by that? And he said to me, well, I don't think Jesus meant by that what you mean by that. And I said, hey, I'm just taking him at his word. Well, what do you think he meant? And he just kind of said, well, let's talk about that some other time. You know, and there are Christians like that. There are those who say, don't like this, don't like that, going to change this, going to change that. And... Uh, what Jesus is saying, I am the amen, he's saying I am a, the bold affirmation of God's truth and God's word. Second thing he says is uh, I am uh, the faithful and true witness. Now Jesus will remain faithful and true no matter what the cost. And the standard of being a witness of Christ is not personal comfort. What am I comfortable with? The standard for a witness to, uh, for Christ is the cross. The one who would go to the cross, who would bear our sin, who would die on our behalf, who would be buried for three days, who would rise again, who would sit at the right hand of the Father. And all who trust in him and have faith in him would have eternal life. You see, the commitment, the, the commitment to truth, the commitment to witness for Christ is the cross. That's the standard, not personal comfort. And Jesus said, there's no end that I would not go to for you. And Jesus is that he is the beginning of God's creation. And what he's saying is, he's not saying he's the first of God's creation, he's a created being. It's talking about priority and preeminence. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Colossians chapter 1, verse 18, where he said, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. So in other words, what it means is Jesus is preeminent right from the beginning. He is the head. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of glory. He is at the top of the church. He is the head of the church, and there is no other. So Jesus is saying, listen, I am the commencement of God's new beginning, God's new creation. Understand this. We are not just, you know, improved human beings. We are new creations in Christ, before we were dead in our sin, but now we have been made alive in Jesus Christ. That is what has happened. And Jesus says, I am the source. Not self-sufficiency, not self-reliance, but I am the source. Let me ask you a question. Can we easily see ourselves 
in Laodicea. Can Milton Bible Church see itself as the church of Laodicea? I mean, we look around and we say, you know what, we do have great hospitals. We do have great health care. We look at the way the government really has, I think, ha handled well um, the pandemic in Canada, both at a national level and at a provincial level and at a regional level. You know, in many ways, we've been incredibly well looked after. We have great universities that are, that are known throughout the world. We have... Um, incredible fashion and shopping, not too far outside of Milton. You see expanded hundreds of stores, you know, with designer labels. And in and, and our holidays and on weekends and, and many times through the week, those places are packed with shoppers, people who are just living in the height of, of current fashion. We also have companies, large companies all around us. We can boast of music and musicians. You know, some of you guys, you like Drizzy, other people, you're believers. Me, I'm a stomping Tom Connors kind of guy. But we have, you know, musicians and, and entertainers and people that are known throughout the world. We have sports. Um, you know, this is not unlike Laodicea. Not unlike Laodicea. And the issue for the Laodiceans allowed their lack of need to push out their need for God. They basically said, God, you know what? I really don't need you. They said that by their lifestyle. They said that by their words. But they said it mostly so by their commitment to the kingdom. In fact, Jesus is basically calling them useless. Look at verse 15. Jesus says, I know your works. You are neither hot, or sorry, you are neither cold nor hot. Would that you are either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Now, the first thing Jesus says is this I know your works. I know your works. I know. God knows. Isn't it great that God knows? Isn't it great that God knows what's in our heart and what's in our life and what's going on? And. And, he, and this is just a statement of intimacy. It's not a rebuke. It's a statement of, you know what? I know what's going on inside you. You know, some of us, we do so much self-analyzing and talking about ourselves and being all about ourselves that we have a PhD in the subject of me. But what, God, but what the Lord Jesus says is, listen, man, I know you better than you know yourself. And I know exactly what you need to make things right. That's such a comforting. And what does he know about these guys? He knows that they were lukewarm. They're lukewarm. What Jesus is not saying, he's not saying, listen, man, I wish you were on fire for me. I wish you were, you know, either on fire and hot or you were totally apathetic and freezing cold. That's not what he's saying. What Jesus is really talking about is usefulness here. He's talking about usefulness. He's saying, listen, you are not like a Hierapolis hot spring, refreshing hot tub, and you are not like an ice-cold Colossae uh, glass of water on a hot summer day. You're neither of those. You're lukewarm water that, frankly, nobody wants to drink, and you spit it out, and it's just, it's not useful. And that's what Jesus is talking about. That's what he's meaning. You're lukewarm and you're not effective for anything. Understand this. We talk about the things we love, don't we? We talk about the things we love. I mean, during this time of COVID-19, how many people haven't said, hey, have you seen any good shows? You know, what have you seen on Netflix that's any good? You know, that's appropriate for families and children and, you know, that's... You know, that's good stuff. You know, when people are sharing, oh, I saw this movie or I saw this show. You know, we talk about those things. We talk about sports, don't we? We talk about baseball, the Jays. We talk about the Raptors and how great they're doing. We did talk for a very short time about the Toronto Maple Leafs, but we don't talk about them anymore. Um, you know, also we talk about the people we love, don't we? 
We talk about our spouses. We talk about our kids. We talk about this. We talk about how they're doing, what they're doing, you know, what their plans are for the fall, blah, 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 what grade they're going into, all that kind of stuff. We talk about the things that we love. So let me ask you a question. How's your Jesus talk doing? Are you in love with him? Are you experiencing him? Do you know him? Are you excited about him? Are you proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom through relationships verbally? Do you know one of the ways that we really reveal our, temp- our spiritual temperature is, you know, we talk about the things that are important to us. And how's, how is it going, how we talk about Jesus and the things of the kingdom and the things that matter? Do you know what the greatest evidence is for a heart that doesn't need God? Do you know what it is? It's prayerlessness. Prayerlessness. Prayerlessness reveals more than anything else a heart that has no need for God, a heart that is self-reliant. So how about you? How about me? Jesus says, because there is a uselessness about you, I spit you out of my mouth. And this isn't about the loss of salvation as much as it is a loss of fellowship. Fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. For you and Jesus. Because really, what Jesus is saying to the Laodiceans is, you know what, we don't seem to need each other anymore. You don't seem to need me at all. So that's the first reason that a self-sufficient church makes Jesus sick is because self-sufficiency makes us ineffective with the gospel. Secondly, self-sufficiency blinds us to our true condition. In verse 17 and 18, it says this, for you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. So I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white, and, and white garments so that you may clothe yourselves and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Now understand there's a kind of humor in what Jesus is saying now. It's kind of, um, you know, there's a form of humor in this because what the Laodicean self-assessment is this. They're, they say, I am rich, I am prosperous, and I need nothing. Can you imagine people saying that to Jesus? That is their self-assessment. I'm rich, I'm prosperous, and I, and, and I don't have need of anything. In other words, what they're saying is, you know, Jesus, I love having you around, but I really don't need you for anything. I got food in the cupboard, the fridge is full, I got two cars in the driveway, I got money in the bank, I got a pool in the backyard, you know, if I'm really stacking it up, I got a cottage to go to, frankly, you know, Jesus really, I don't have a lot of need for you, and Jesus gives his assessment of the Laodicean church, and he says this, you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked, pretty different. Isn't it amazing how two people can be in the same relationship and see things completely differently? I don't know how many times I've had couples come into my office and they're in trouble. And so I say to the guy, hey, dude, what's going on? Why, did you, why are you guys here today? And he turns to me and says, you know what, uh, Pastor, I'll be honest with you. I really don't know. I don't know what the big deal is. I don't really see that what, you know, what the big issue is. And so I say to her, I say, hey, how about you? Tell me uh, what's going on. What brings you in here? And uh, she's like, you know what? I have had it. I am ready to divorce. I am ready to walk out the door. I have had enough. This thing is as cold as ice. We are done. There is no pulse left in this, in, in this corpse. And I think to myself, how in the world... Can she say, it's over, and he say, I don't have a clue what's going on. You would be shocked at how many times that happens. Far too many. How two people can see the same thing incredibly differently. But sometimes that happens in church, too. Somebody says, hey, 
we're meeting budget. Isn't that fantastic? There's money in the bank. There, there are people watching us online that, that are really loving things. And there are people who are coming. You know, our, our Sunday morning attendance in person at the Connect Center is doing really well. Do you know what? The ministries are going well. People really like us. So things must be great, right? What Jesus says is, what good is all that? If you have lost your love for me, you don't need me. In fact, you are not producing me in others. You are not making disciples, transforming lives, seeing the kingdom come. Verse 18, Jesus says, I counsel you. Now understand, these are merciful words because Jesus can easily say, listen, I command you. He is the king of king, lord of lords, the head of the church. But instead of using imperatives, he uses gentle words, merciful words, words of grace. And he says, this is the counsel, this is the advice I give to you. Buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Now, can you imagine if you were part of the Laodicean church and you heard those words? You know, buy from me um, so that you may be rich. I mean, they might be saying, listen, Jesus, have you checked out my bank account lately? I already am rich. I'm already doing pretty well. And Jesus says, you know what? That is the problem. The love of money is the root of evil in your life, and you don't even see it. And you need a different currency, a currency that is going to buy you something else. And this is what he says. Buy from me white garments and salve to anoint your eyes. You see, they were naked and they were blind. And their response was, what are you talking about, Jesus? We're not naked. We have the most stylish, famous, black wool garments that Asia Minor, the entire peninsula, is raving about. We are in the height of fashion. We're not naked. And you know what? We don't need self for our eyes because we live in a city that invented a salve, a cure for eyes, for blindness, for relief of difficulties. You know, what are you talking about? And Jesus says, listen. He's saying, really, he's saying that they need to clothe themselves in white, in the white of his purity, and his righteousness, and they need to open their eyes to the way God sees them, the way, they, the way God sees the world, because they're blinded to what is going on around them. You see, the gospel of Jesus Christ, when we truly understand it, the gospel of Jesus Christ changes our worldview. It changes everything. When we understand that we were once lost, without hope, yet Jesus reached down to us. Not only did he reach down, he came down and he became a man. And when he died on the cross and he bore our sin he, and we put our faith in him, we exchanged our sin for his righteousness. And he said, you need to walk in that. You need to, to view life through that. And so when we see the gospel and we have a world gospel worldview, it changes our hearts. It changes how we give. It changes our relationships in our home. It changes the way we do mission. It changes the way we serve. It changes everything, how we use our time, all of those things. The gospel changes us. And Jesus says, listen, you need some eye ointment so that you can see again. Do you know what? I wear these glasses. They're readers. They're just cheapos. But I wear them, and they're actually pretty strong. If I look at my notes right now, I, everything is just a blur. I cannot see a thing. Everything's a blur. But when I put on my glasses, it begins to make sense again. You know, I don't know how often people have sat in my office and they're, they have their head in their hands and they're like, oh my goodness, you know, my marriage is a wreck, my business is in trouble, my health is suffering, I'm not getting along with, you know, my kids, my neighbors think I'm a jerk. How did I get here? How did I get here? 
If you're a leader, I want you to understand this. You know what your job is? Number one job is to point people to Jesus. To point people to Jesus Christ. Their number one need, our number one need, your number one need is to be fully dependent on him always and for everything. The third thing that Jesus says, the third thing that he says is self-sufficiency separates us from fellowship with Christ. In verse 19, he says, those whom I love, I I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. They're loving words of rebuke. Do you know what? Nobody wants to come into church and be beat up for 30 minutes. I mean, nobody enjoys that, right? Nobody enjoys being rebuked. Nobody enjoys being corrected. Nobody enjoys being disciplined. They just don't. But the truth is, my greatest idol in the world is me. My greatest problem in the world is me. And I need to tear down that idol. And I need to put Jesus Christ in his place. And I need to worship him and declare him to be the Lord of glory in me and over me in all things. And to say, I have no hope if you are not my hope. And declare our total dependence upon him. We need to declare our total dependence upon Jesus every day. Every day. That's why Jesus says in verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. You see, Jesus is willing to come in and to have fellowship in the life of the church in ways that we have never seen before if we would open the door of our hearts to him. He, in many churches, is not really in the door. I mean, how often are we singing gospel thin songs that really are all about us? And preaching where we white out certain parts of the Bible because they're uncomfortable and because they're difficult and because they aren't politically correct or whatever the case might be. Instead of just saying, I will obey and adhere to the whole counsel of God. Where there's no dependence and no life. And you know what? The picture here is Jesus isn't even in the church. He's outside of the church. He's outside of the door, and the people are on the other side of the door. And what he's saying, listen, I stand at the door and knock. If you will open the door, I will enter in, and we will experience an abundant life like you have never seen before, an intimacy sharing life together. I want you to remember, this is written to a church. And the best place that you can be today is to be broken and in need. Do you know one of the old songs, the old hymns that has been so instrumental in many people coming to Christ as Savior and renewing their heart with him is the old hymn. And the title is Just As I Am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. The singing of that song, more people have walked the aisle both literally and figuratively in their hearts to welcome Christ in, a humility, a declaration of dependence, saying, Lord, I need you. Do you know what? That's the meeting that Jesus is at. That's the church service where he does his best work. And that's what he's all about. And then look at the reward. Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In other words, Jesus says, you know, just as when I ascended into heaven, I sat down on my father's throne, guess what? You're going to come and you're going to sit on my knee. And we're going to enjoy the view together. And we're going to rule together and reign together. And uh, we're going to have great fellowship together. And that's the reward for those who would declare their dependence upon him. The reward is rich, and it's great both now and in the future. So let me ask you a question. Self-sufficient, self-reliant, or fully dependent upon him? 
which category are we in? Or are we kind of wrestling and we're somewhere on that scale? Well, let's all get over here and just say, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every day I need you. Every way I declare I'm dependent upon you. I just want to pray for us. And I want to pray a prayer of dependency. Oh, I just want to pray a prayer in which we just dedicate ourselves to God as we wrap up this series. So would you bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Father, I just want to thank you for your word, the living word, Jesus Christ, and how he speaks to each one of us so clearly and carefully and lovingly with great tenderness and mercy. And gently, in a way that, you know, we've been rebuked, but many times it's, uh, I don't know, it's just done in such a way that we know that you love us. And so what we want to say is, Lord Jesus, we declare today our dependency upon you. We say that we have no hope if you are not our hope that we will cry out to you with everything that we have and everything that we are, and we will keep crying out to you until your ears are sore and you're tired of us coming back to you again and again. And we ask that you would once again release your blessing that you would shower down from heaven the love and fellowship and friendship and usefulness in the kingdom of God that you desire to give to us. And so, Lord, we don't want to be lukewarm. We don't want to be useless. We want to be useful. We want to be kingdom builders. We want to be disciple makers. And so, Lord, we just say we have no possible chance of doing that without you doing it all. So we say, come Lord Jesus, come. Come into our hearts and change us forever. May your life fill our life. May our life and may we die so that you might live. And Lord, we will give you the glory and declare our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you for listening so very carefully and for being a part of this series. I hope you've enjoyed it over the summer. Next week, uh, Pastor Jordan Harnum's going to preach. He's going to do a a great job. So make sure you tune in and you enjoy that because it's going to be amazing. We thank God for all that he's doing and for all that he will do. And let us just give ourselves totally to him in Christ's name. Have a great week, everybody. Amen.